Hey everyone, welcome back to Together We Are Thursdays. This week's topic is um, relationships and how your ED affects your relationships. Um, it could be friends, it could be a significant other. I think Georgina was asking in the context of a significant other. Um, and um, Michelle's video addressed like friendships, how it affects friendships. So, um, all of us kind of mentioned some unifying principles that, um, eating disorders are very much a solitary, isolating, self-perpetuating illness. Um, the ED voice will try to convince you that you have no needs. I think it was a Maria Hornbacher quote that said, we turn skeletons into goddesses and look to them as if they can teach us how not to need. Um, that's like a really good analogy, really. Um, if you negate need, you can't be hurt. Um, and that's like a big thing um, in anorexia where if you are not vulnerable, you can't be hurt. How do you get vulnerable? You need other people. So if you don't need people, i.e. you self-soothe by getting into your maladaptive eating disorder sort of mechanism, then you don't need to go to a confidant, you don't need to open your heart. It's all bullshit, of course, and all of that thinking does is make you sicker. Um, but that's pretty much how it works. Um, it becomes an infatuation, an obsession. It takes over your life, every aspect of your life. Um, the mindset, the voice is always with you and always... Um, sorry for the scuffling in the background. I was trying to chase one of the kitties. Not a good idea to pick on Paloma, honey. And I think one of the reasons, too, that... Um, people who are immersed in their ED end up romanticizing it is it becomes very much like a relationship in and of itself between you and the disease. It sounds really strange to people who don't experience it, but it is very much like you and this entity that only communicates with you in the privacy of your own mind that nobody else can see, hear, or know. And you two have, you know, your secret world. And this is a way that you cope. Like, the brain comes up with this as a maladaptive response to hardship. We've gotten into etiology before. I'll try not to get too tangential. But, um, obviously then, it's a critical influence on relationships. Um, people who are newer to the journey tend to gradually sequester themselves, pull away from friends, family, um, Anyone who can distract them from this 24-7 preoccupation with obsession, um, a gross minimization of your whole world, down to food, calories, exercise, how you feel, how much you weigh, we all know the minutiae. So, yeah, I mean, relationships are deeply, deeply affected. Um, personally, for me, um, I leave. You're driving me crazy. Can you not do that, please? Don't do that, honey, okay? That's driving me nuts. She's like, scratching up the floor mat and distracting me and irritating me. Hey, knock it off. I leave. No. You don't need to do that. Thank you, baby. She's a puppy. She's just learning. Yeah. Do you guys want an Eileen shot? Hi, me. Say hi. She's 6.6 .6 pounds this week. This is the little uh, mat she was playing with. So, yep. This is her 14th week. She's awesome. And very rambunctious. <laughs> so, yeah. She's the best. She's great therapy. Um, so, friendships. I have made friends because of eating disorder things, and I have lost friends because of eating disorder things. Um, it all depends where you are on the journey and what you're looking for. Um, but 
as a rule, they're very isolated and damaging to family, friends, significant others, regardless. Um, I have never been popular, have never had a lot of friends. Um, I was like the nerd girl growing up. Um, had abuse going on in the home, physical, verbal, sexual. Um, not a good time. So I didn't really learn like the nuances of socialization and how to like what a friend is. Michelle was kind of talking about that too. Like she didn't really know what an actual friend was, and I guess I didn't either really until university. Isn't that sad? Like even in high school, it was just. I don't know, I was always like the weird geek nerd, I didn't really connect, I had like one dear dear friend and that was from, uh, my mother and I had moved to Northern California um, when I was 14, or 13, and we were there a little over a year, we left, we were there for the one we had an earthquake, um, and it was like really scary and traumatic and stuff, so mom brought us back here to Colorado, which was a disaster. But the point being, when that one year in California, I was actually, like, not the nerd pariah, and it was really a culture shock, like, not being pursued, made fun of, looked at sideways, you know. Come on, you guys, I'm trying to make a video here. Yeah, I'll in here playing the video. Yachai yeah, is Eileen's best friend. It's so cute that a dog and a cat are best friends, but... <laughs> you guys are silly! <laughs> I'm not gonna get any peace in this room. <laughs> These two are so crazy. So crazy! Yes! Um, speaking of animals, that's something else, like, my mother will say. She fully admits that she likes people, or likes animals better than people. So, maybe that's something I've grown up with, too. She didn't really have close friends. I don't think my sister did. Just, I don't know. Um, deep relationship, meaningful relationships didn't really, I don't know, resonate with me until I actually found some kindred spirits in college that I connected with. And Yes, Ivy, you're very cute. Sorry guys, um, as for love relationships, I have several bad relationships, and I'm not going to get into it, but I will talk about my current relationship, um, my husband and I are so blessed to have found each other, um, like I said, we both came from a long line of toxic, negative, unfulfilling, loveless relationships, and, um, now that, you know, when we found each other, it was just, you know, we have gratitude for every positive moment, um, it's really beautiful, and I never thought it would happen to me, and my family never thought it would happen to me, and on one level it's insulting, probably sounding insulting to other people, but really, I was just such an awkward bird, like, I still am, I'm pretty unusual, I don't, I'm pretty weird, um, that people thought, nope, she'll never get married, you know, just didn't seem like I was that type, I guess, so, yeah, uh, meeting my husband changed my world, um, I had pretty much come home from university when I got too sick to finish and came home to die. That was pretty much where I was at when I moved back here after not being able to finish my schooling. And, um, he was a very unexpected blessing. And, you know, this is what I want to say. People in general have difficulty with relationships, okay? But if you have an ED, it only compounds the subversiveness, the secretiveness, the not revealing, not totally opening your heart, not being genuine. You say, act, do, um, form interests around 
the person that you are wanting to facilitate some kind of connection with and it becomes a mirroring effect and there's nothing genuine in it and a lot of people with EDs and other mental illnesses get into this where it's it's the yeah me too syndrome like you meet somebody and they're really into Lord of the Rings so then you're really into Lord of the Rings or you know, they're really into books so you're really into books and whatever they're into like it all becomes a reflection of someone else because it's like what would okay I Lee seriously chill out honey I need to finish this and you need to calm down um where was I being genuine I think that's the hardest thing for people and Honestly, I did not start genuinely, genuinely, genuinely connecting until I was honest. And being honest does mean being vulnerable. And it does mean being risked not being liked. Risking not being liked. And it does mean that differences are more amplified. But if you want a genuine connection in a relationship, if you want soul fulfillment, if you want genuine connection you have to be willing to open your heart and this is a huge issue most anorexics and I th I'm not sure but I think a lot of EG suffers also um, we are phenomenal givers and terrible receivers um, we will you know Michelle was talking about that too like listening to her friends she could she could console them with anything but she didn't feel she could ever go to them and i still struggle with this i still am much more readily moved to reach out offer comfort solace sicker advice and it's a genuine it's genuine love and empathy but to ask for the same to be Comfortable receiving is a whole different bird, like... Hi, Lee. You're driving me nuts, honey. I'm almost done, okay? I'm almost done. Just bear with me a little more, okay? And then we'll go outside. Okay? I love you. Um... So, yeah. Just being genuine is... is hard, and it doesn't come naturally. So, my big cathartic epiphany came after six months of morbid depression um and loneliness having come home lost everything given up on like just waiting like hurry up and let me die already um and i don't mean in a suicidal way i mean like in a chronic illness way because i have like major things going on um but the universe had more in store so um one day i had enough and I had enough of being afraid. I had enough of pretending because I wanted to be well liked. I had enough of just the bullshit, I guess. And decided to complete an exercise in being totally open and honest. Um, and I went to actually, um, what was it? Yahoo Personals. Yeah, it was an online dating site. And I wrote a very therapeutic profile. And it wasn't really that I expected anybody to reply, which was even better. Because for me, it was just a one last F you to the world. It was a very bitter, angry, but very frank, open and honest, cathartic, healing, therapeutic experience where I was like, okay, while well, you all sit around and talk about how you're tired of the bar scene, and all other kinds of innocuous details that say nothing about you as a person. And I like, I like hiking and, yeah, I like music and good times and having fun and, yeah, I'm tired of the bar scene. Well, you know what, you basically just said nothing. And that's pretty much how dating goes in person, online, regardless. So I wrote a very honest, open, to the point, direct, explicit profile entry. And, um, sorry, I leave playing with one of the kitties. I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, 
and I, this is me. Here are my good qualities. Here are my shady qualities. I'm really, really sick, and I have nothing to offer you. I have no money. I have no degree. I have nothing at all. What do I do have? I have a genuine, open, loving heart. And, you know, I, you know, listed, like, positives and negatives. All, like, just, here you go. Boom. This is me. Actually me. Still interested? Give me a call. If you're not, or, you know, send me a message. If not, great. I just saved both of us a hell of a lot of time. Peace out. Well... I actually did get a few responses, and then that's how I met my husband. And we've literally been happily ever after ever since. It's a sickeningly sweet, eternal puppy love story. But the lesson is, if you're genuine, so yeah. Um, it is very important to be genuine. So that's like the moral of that story. It's not easy, and for me it took being in a rock bottom place where I was willing to um, reveal myself and that was only the very beginning because it's easy when you're in a fed up place and it's just a release it's a lot harder on a day to day basis it's a lot harder to be vulnerable it's a lot harder to make mistakes um, and you know I'm not perfect either but I've come a long way and I can honestly say it is so important to be genuine don't be afraid to have your own likes, have your own interests, and not spend your life mirroring off everyone else. And if you're earlier in the journey, you may not have any clue what those things are. A lot of young people in ETs haven't developed those things on their own. They have created a facade or a personality or an affect representative of how they believe other people want them to be, or how they feel they should be rather than who they truly are and honoring oneself. And it's a long journey to learn how to do that. And it doesn't come overnight. So if you're freaked out because you don't know exactly who you are, it's very, very common. You're not alone and it will come. It will come, it won't come overnight, but you will start to piece yourself together. No matter how deep you are in your eating disorder, no matter how long you've been sick, there is an intrinsic self. Your life may have become 99% ED affect, but you're still in there. You never entirely lose yourself. And working toward recovery will help you strengthen your intrinsic self and diminish the influence of pathology in your life. So okay, most embarrassing moment. Since I just told you about being honest and um, not being afraid of not being disliked and stuff, like, please, it's not that easy, but I will share something that I am really, really, really embarrassed about. When I was four years old, and I don't remember why, I was mad at a neighbor. partied on their driveway <laughs> and of course I guess I was seen and they called my mom but yeah that that's pretty damn embarrassing stuff so be genuine guys love you be well see you next week